Today, we're excited to be joined by Shelly Zalas, the CEO of the Female Quotient, working with companies that curate experiences, thought leadership, and solutions designed to achieve gender equality at work. In 2018, Shelly was the Matrix Award honoree issued by New York Women in Communications and has had so much more great accolades and success. And Shelly, it's so great to see you here at CES. And I'm just like... I'm already on fire with you. Like I know. I, we could just talk forever. So about before so many we even started things. filming the podcast, Shelly and I just kind of jumped into it. So this could be a really exciting one. And I mean, tell me about CES. You've been here for how long? Uh, gosh, we. Uh, it feels like one day has been four weeks already because we've had so many amazing. I mean, how many years have you been coming here? Oh gosh, I think this is our tenth year here. We're the official equality partners of CES. And, so what does that mean? Uh, well, we help them with their programming. We ensure that there's diversity on every stage for them. We also brought the sex toys back, <laughs> which is amazing. I mean, I don't know why they got rid of them. Uh, <laughs> so we brought those back because uh, that, that's important too. But, you know, most importantly, um, we do a walking tour, a Girls Gone walking tour. Yesterday, uh, no, Tuesday, we did uh, the first morning. We had over 300 women walking the showroom floor, floor. The showroom floor together. And it was absolutely remarkable. And we started, I mean, that's how the female quotient really started was at CES. So And that's interesting because really electronics here. tech predominantly a male uh dominated industry. And CES used to be completely different because CES when I used to come was actually really electronic devices. Now you have media and tech companies here. But was that why you came to CES specifically, just based upon the makeup of the industry? Well, I mean, I'm I'm a, a woman in tech, so I pioneered online research. So if you've ever taken one of those shitty surveys on the internet, sorry, not sorry, but I'm the mother of that invention. And that was probably in 2000, I started a company called OTX, Online Testing Exchange, and migrated research from offline to online. And that was in a day and age where only wealthy old men had broadband connections. Right. Yeah, you know, 14 four modems or something like that. It was and before it was, the iPad, it was before the iPhone, and it was right. you know, way ahead of its time. And it was before SurveyMonkey and you know all of that and, and had to create the blender is what I called it with online sample and mixing and matching. Why did you decide and, to start OTX? Well, I was in market research and, uh, you know, mall intercept and telephone. Yeah. Clipboards, all and, that stuff. Yeah, you know, when, you know, we would... Check, 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 you know, if you were the right demographic and paper pencil surveys and all of that kind of stuff. And I was then doing um, website testing and efficiencies and, you know, all of that kind of stuff. Yeah. So, and then I had this idea to, well, why not just move research online? But there was no one online. So I had to build the whole ecosystem. And I remember one day closing my eyes and thinking about how we did RDD, random digit dialing. And you needed the phone books and we'd go into the you know, phone book and find the people that you would call. And how do I simulate that same scenario? To phone do, intercepts, doing it online. How, yeah. How do you migrate that concept to do online? And I thought, well, we have to pull the sample from all of the different websites. Right. That you were need there. a statistically significant sample set that your clients could look and so at. I thought I had to build this blender that would take sample from... Everyone's... Did you have a tech background when you started it? No. So how did but, you learn about? Well, that's that was the way to do it. You have to go to the lowest common denominator, right? To do representative sample for research. But even to build the technology, you need technology. I chops. actually hired this guy. He was 21 years old. That was helping me do website testing, and um, said, "I just need sort of a website for research, market research." Yeah. And it was sort of a website at the beginning, and. It was it was really quite an amazing evolution. So, let me ask you a question: Being in the market research industry, even today, I can tell you that online research there's just a lot of hesitation with in terms of the audience quality, and you know, a lot of clients still want to work with the legacy services because they trust them more. It's an industry that doesn't move fast. It must have been really challenging to get clients to adopt and buy into. Oh, this you have no platform. idea. I have how... some idea, but probably not as much as you, because you were the pioneer in this space. You know, I always say when you're building something new, you have to be the first, the second, and the third. Yeah. The first is always the innovator that makes all the mistakes. You got to fail to succeed. The second is the copycat. They copy everything that you do, but they don't really understand what's under the hood. Yeah. The third is the sweeper. They ride in on the shiny white horse because you've already built the ecosystem and they they win the game. That happened with um, MP3 players. Uh, it happens, it happens on, with social media. On, but yeah. <laughs> when you are someone that has worked their ass off and, you know, 
really believes in what you're doing, I I always said to myself, I need to be the first, I'm going to be the second, I and I am going to be the third, because there is no one that will beat me at my own So you game. basically disrupted yourself. I disrupted myself every single time. And I actually sold my same company three times. And it is, and that's a whole other story in and of itself. And if I tell you the tricks of the trade of things I did and how I brought an online business where everyone told me it wasn't the right time, I have to wait, there's no ecosystem. And I remember I, I do a lot of teaching in business school because I love listening to young people and giving back and yeah. learning. And I don't like grading papers and all that, so I'll never be a full time professor, but I love learning. And so I, I go in and out and do guest lecturing. And I was at um, Wharton and teaching a course, and I was talking about the whole blender. And everyone told me, oh, that's so unsophisticated. I'm like, no, but it's true. You need all sample from different places to create representative population. Right. The first 18 year old that needs to go to this survey will come, boom, boom, boom. And you wrote, I rotated like this. And I, I said, gosh, it's like Dr. Seuss is one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. And I remember saying, okay, class, get up. We're going to go down to the library. And we went down to the library and I had everyone sit around. They had a little kid's area. And I read everyone the book, one fish, two fish, red fish, blue fish. And I said, it's like you need to have the big ocean where you have all kinds of fish. That's an ecosystem. Yeah. And that was the inspiration behind my blender. I needed to collect all sample from all different places, but put it into this big blender because you can't just have sample from Greenfield at the time and sample from AOL and just use the AOL sample because you needed it to be blend. Skewed. Right. It could be skewed. Yeah. Oh, you get it. Of course Boom. I get it. <laughs> and that was the inspiration for my blender. And then from then everyone started getting in the business. And I but then I said, Oh, and I wanted sample from even mobile companies because there was this young guy that Matt Dusick that had his mobile thing, but he didn't know how to use it for, and so I put his sample in and this and this and this, and then that, next thing you know, I had a hundred sample providers. Boom, 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 What boom. about the customer side? What about storytelling the customers getting people to buy into your product? That was so easy because I built a whole model around incentivizing, but But did the clients way, trust the data and they trusted the of research? Of course they didn't, no. But I parallel tested against the, mall data that we had tons of data. And so I I did not I said to clients, don't trust me. Right. It's like Coke Pepsi challenge. I have thing, no right? <laughs> I have no norms. Right. And so I parallel tested and I gave free data. Smart. Free data. And you know what I did? And this was before we even had online um data. And they all were they wanted paper. And so I would give them back Stacks and stacks of paper, because that's what they were used to. They wanted the paper trail of the research actually being in the, the real work behind the But data. what they trusted still was offline. And I started in the movie business, even though my background was CPG, consumer package good data. And so I started in the movie business. In CPG, it's womb to tomb, Com yep. TV commercials. Yep. In the movie business, which I had zero experience, you needed information within 48 hours, movie trailers which are two and a half minutes long, yep. not 30 seconds. Hardest thing to do online because you have to DRM, you have to you know, make sure you secure it because a movie could open and close in two seconds flat. Yep. But to secure online where it was still very slow. Yeah. I mean, you understand that, right? And how do you secure your stuff? This is in 2000. This is right. a really long time ago, way ahead of its time. So I was- Yeah, video barely worked on the internet in 2000. It, would, it was pixelated. It wasn't right. I mean, it's like if you're on a freeway with lots of traffic with 14.4 modem, imagine the download. Right. And tons of people on it. I mean, now we have, you know, very high speed internet. But at the time, it was really what slow. What gave you the ambition and conviction to do something that's so disruptive? It Was that the first time you were an entrepreneur and it started something? Yes. So what was the moment where you're like, you know what, I'm going out on my own. I'm going to launch this. I, I, I saw it. And by the way, everyone, and I was at That's a traditional. That's not A lot of I people was, see stuff, but they don't start a company. I was at a traditional research company, ASI. Mm -hmm. And 
I went to my bosses. I said, I have this ridiculous idea, but it's time to migrate research from offline to online. And they all told me it's not the right time. No one's online. And I happened to be on a panel with Larry Mock, who was the chief research officer of Procter & Gamble. And my bosses are all in the front row, and I'm whispering to Larry. And I come off the panel, and my bosses all said to me, what did you talk to him about? What were you whispering to him about? I said, so I just asked him, when's the right time to come into Procter and talk to you about migrating research from offline to online? And he said, next week. And I said, oh, my God, okay. And my bosses said, great, Paul will go, Ringo will go, and Star will go. And I'm like, what about Shelly? And they said, it's a boys club. That's the right audience. That's where the right team to go. And I said, well, if I'm not going, I'm going to cancel the meeting, and you can all wait for the right time. I love that. And that was, and I call these heartbeat moments. It was my heartbeat moment where I'm like, well, why, when, and why am I not? Right. When can I be the boss? Right. And so you I made decided, yourself the boss. The only way I'll ever be right is if I'm the boss. And I had already been doing, you know, website testing and I did infomercial testing and I built new solutions. And I just said, you know what? I'm going to go. And I needed a million dollars because I promised this young kid that if I ever am going to do this, I will give him a million dollars. I didn't have it. And I said, but if someone ever buys into it, I will give you a million dollars. And I went to Nielsen. To do what? To give? Build me a online portal. Right. I saw it in my All head. All the development, yep. No one believed me except my father and my husband. And they each said they'd give me half a million. But I didn't want to take their money because I knew that A, I didn't have it. We, my husband is a, a butt doctor, colorectal surgeon, but he was a fellow. We didn't have the money. Right. And I knew if I took their money, I would not take risk. I'd be safe. That's the problem with taking friends and family money. It's too personally connected. And I, I didn't even know that at the time, but I just, and so I went to Nielsen and I said, I'm going to pioneer online research. And they said, we love that idea. What do you need? I said, I need a million dollars for this kid. I didn't think about me. And they said, okay. And I gave away 80% of the business, whatever the business was going to be or not going to be. And I handed this young kid a check and I said, let's build it. And that was that. And that's how I started. Are you still in touch with him today? And I called it, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. He's Patrickoff. Oh, wow. <laughs> Alan it's, Patrickoff's well, he, son? He's Trevor Kaufman that went into business with Patrickoff's right. son. Yeah. And that is how I started. And I called it Real Research, R-E-E-L at the time, and pioneered it at Nielsen, built a whole movie business around it, first of its kind, and... The way I got my first client, which is hysterical, was I went to Warner Brothers and there was a company that was, it was um, Joe Farrell, NRG, was legend. And th they had a monopoly in movie research. It was mall intercept testing. They had every studio and they were unbreakable. There was no competitor. And I said to Warner Brothers, are you completely satisfied with how you do mo movie research today. And I use the word completely. And they said, well, who's ever completely satisfied? Right. And no one's ever broken the monopoly, ever, because Joe Farrell was the godfather to every single movie studio CEO, producer, d director. He was institutionalized there. Because he was the studio whisperer told everyone how their movie was going to open and close and whatever. And he had the keys to the Were castle. Were you based in LA at this point? Yeah. I knew no one in the movie business, but I was a brilliant researcher, but I knew no one in the movie business. And the head of research looked at me and he said, and I said, I have this crazy idea to migrate research to the internet. The internet? What is that? And I said, and I won't charge you a nickel. All I want is when you test in the mall, I want to parallel test the same spot online for one year. Give me all your data. That's the way to do and it. And that's all I want. And they said, it's a deal. They said, but we have exclusivity with Joe Farrell. You can't tell anyone because we will be in trouble. Right. I said, mom's the word. That was the deal. 
And they said, but we have a contract and it has exclusivity. I said, let me see your contract. In the contract, it said they have exclusivity with NRG for mall intercept testing. Right. That was the loophole. I said, but I'm online. And that is how I got into every single studio. And you took that year and you proved that your data was just as good and more efficient. It was even better than that. I said, when you go to meetings, what I found from what I was doing, while I didn't want to replace the recall testing and all of that, because that was normative based, what online had at the time that was genius was the open-ended responses. I had the best open-ended- The qualitative was, why behind the what? Was genius. And at the time, it had people were putting in bold and exclamation. And I said to the studios, I want you to go into the producer meetings and give them still the mall testing quant. quant right. And you bring in the qual. And don't tell them where it came from because then they'll doubt it. Just show them that. And so they would go in with their quant. With their quant and, and I say, you can even call it NRG if you want. Let them think that's what it is. And just come in with the qual, the new enhanced. And the producers and directors were like, holy shit. What the hell happened? This is the best stuff I've ever seen. Where'd you get it? And like, oh, it's this new thing. It's online. Ba, 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 ba. And then I said slowly, and I'm going to actually now not give you all these pages. I'm going to start sending you stuff online so you, we can start eliminating some paper trail. And when I would send the online, I would also send homemade chocolate chip cookies and milk. And I said, and when you read it online, here's a little something. Enjoy your reading. Next thing you knew, word traveled. And then I started parallel testing and calibrating norms and showing them that actually my data was more reliable than mall. And within two years, I started replacing mall. And poor Joe Farrell started calling me her. If you are going to use her, I'm not going to give you my data anymore. But by then, I was already able to replace his scores. I was the only company in the world that was able to break an unbreakable company that was the only company in the world providing scores to the movie industry. And that was my little company that became OTX, first company in the world that was now an alternative to NRG. It's amazing. And I think like when I hear the story, it's like the things that dawn on me is you had conviction, you had perseverance, you know, you believed in yourself. Those things are really the, the hallmarks of what a great makes a great entrepreneur, right? Because without those things, you could have a great product, but you're not going to have that internal willpower to push through. You know, I just had, you know, I, I hire for passion, train for skill. I was passionate about what I was doing, resilient. I knew I was on to something and I wasn't going to stop. And, you know, I'm, and I built an uncorporate model, you know, and I, you know, I always say when you love what you do, it's called passion. When you don't, it's called stress. And I loved what I did. And there were tons of hurdles, you know, I, I built something for the first time. And, and, you know, today, what makes me so proud of online research is there's so many, um, Spinoffs. I mean, online research is a thing. I mean, it's not, it wasn't a tr trend. It, it stuck. And a lot of people take a lot of credit for, you know, online research. I know where it came from. You know, we didn't have social media at the time. And there's not a lot of um, reports written. I mean, you'll see a lot of stories, but this is a long time ago. And, you know, a young guy that worked for me um, ha has taken the um, sample blender technology and has now, you know, built a huge sample company, just sold it for, I sold my company for 80 million. He sold my sample technology. A lot of sample companies have, you know, come from that. Of course. He sold it for a billion dollars, you know, and so watching the evolution and the evolution and the evolution yeah, you and the, the path improvement. for companies like Susie, we should rename our company Shelly. Yeah, but I love that, <laughs> you know, and I think that 
makes me proud, it you know, to you see proud. what has come from all that and how technology, I mean, when I was doing online surveys, I was using avatars. My kids have little talking avatars for surveys, or we were using, you know, the concept of QR codes before QR codes. It wasn't sticky then because, as you said, consumer adoption has to be ready for it. It was too ahead of itself. Avatars. Now everyone's like, oh, right. the Web3 and virtual world. I was doing that. No one wanted it. It was like, oh, or, you know, QR codes. You need the adoption. Consumers weren't there yet. It was a good idea. Yeah. Too ahead of itself. You know? So you ran that for 10 years? Oh, gosh. Who knows? I was, <laughs> I was in research. I only, you know, I was the only female CEO top 25 my entire career. I've been in a boys club my whole career. Didn't hold me back at all. I'm sure I'm owed a shitload of money and I'm sure I was paid less than, you know, everyone in, you know, in my field. And if I went back and checked my paycheck, I could probably get paid a lot. You know, they probably owe me a lot of money. Right. Didn't affect me at all. I was always, I well, was believed in myself. You were passionate what you were doing. Yeah. Your no regrets. You know, I, I really have a philosophy of, you know, I never want to look back and say should have, would have, could have. So I, I have zero regrets and I've had the most amazing journey and it led me to where I am today. Yeah, so let's talk about female quotient. For those in the audience who don't know what female quotient is, what is it? So I sold my company, um, uh, OTX, to, well, I when I left Nielsen, I went to iFilm. iFilm was the YouTube then, which... Mm -hmm you know, was a, an amazing company. And I built the next iteration of uh, online. So it was real research at Nielsen. I then went to um, iFilm and created OTX, then sold it from iFilm to Bob Pittman and Strauss Zelnick, which was, you know, really an entrepreneurial um, undertaking going to the VC. And then from there, I sold it to Ipsos, the third largest research company in the world. <clears throat> and was running innovation in 83 countries. Um, I stayed there for five years and realized after that it was time to give back with generosity what I wish I had my entire career. Which was? A network of women supporting women. I'm 61 years old. I did not have that. You know, I lived in a Mad Men era, truly. And, um, you know, I rose the ranks very successfully. But I really did feel that what I really could do now was get back what I wish I had. And so I um, decided I wanted to go to CES. And this is the question that you asked me. Um, a, a tech trade show, I was a techie, you know, but I built for the lowest common denominator because that's how you get consumers, mm -hmm. which is, you know, what, what you need for market research. And I heard there was 150,000 people going, less than 3% were women. And so I called five girlfriends of mine and I said, let's walk the floor together. I don't want to go by myself. And if you know other women, please invite them. 24 hours later, 50 women showed up to walk the floor. That was 10 years ago. And the most remarkable things happened. Two things. One, 50 women walking the floor. I called it power of the pack. A woman alone has power. Collectively, we have impact. When I would walk the floor alone, you're invisible. When 50 women walk the floor, the invisible become visible. It was this whoosh moment. That's all I can explain because that's what I felt like. Every single guy's head turned like, where the hell did all you women come from? Boom. And it, it just lit me up. I was like, this is incredible feeling. And the second thing that happened was I was surrounded by women just like me. How'd you find them? Or how did well, they find I, you? I, I knew women just in the industry. Just your network, Yeah, right. but we were never together. You know, we've always been individuals. Yeah. And we were talking about work-life balance and imposter syndrome, and we were all doing deals with one another, and we all were power of the, pa you know, we all had tons of money spending it with each other. Wow, what a concept. You know, we... We, there's such a scarcity of women at the top. We were trained to compete with one another, but why? And we were in my little hotel room that the next day, you know, 20, 50 turned to 100, 100 to 300, and we were in my suite. And that is how the girls lounge started. And it was called the girls lounge. The opposite of boy is girl. The opposite of club is lounge. If there's a boys club now, there's a girls lounge. 
And then I thought, gosh, if I could connect women in tech, what about women in marketing? What about women in media? What about women in finance? What about women in cybersecurity? What about women in space? What about? So I thought, gosh, I'll do these girls' lounges, these pop-up spaces that women could connect and collaborate and have safe spaces and and meet other women and not feel alone at these big conferences dominated by men at every conference. So I did a girls' lounge at Cannes and a girls' lounge at South by Southwest and a girl, you know. Did where, you think about a business model at that point or you just wanted to solve the problem of getting women well, together? I needed a business model because I don't charge membership. Right. And so I needed brands to sponsor it. But I didn't really have that concept yet. So I sponsored it myself. Right. And thought, simple. I'll just pay for that. And the idea started when I was at Ipsos. So the girls' lounge started at Ipsos. And I had Ipsos pay for it because I was running Global Innovation. So I'll have Ipsos. It was the Ipsos Girl Sound. So that's how the model started. Ipsos was the brand sponsoring it. After my five years at Ipsos, I decided time to go and do it myself. Then I get invited to the World Economic Forum. My invitation was, we want you to come, but you might not feel welcome. Once again, They my, literally said that to you? Yeah, that was the invitation. There was one little spot left. And so I said, you know, my head said, who wants to go? That's not a very nice invitation. My heart said, I must. And I've always wanted to be invited to the World Economic Forum. Yeah. That's a dream come true. And I, I went to a big brand that goes to the World Economic Forum. And they said, we love the idea, but we don't like the name. You got to change the name. I said, I'm not changing the name. The get name of Girls Lounge. Right. Yeah. And so... And it was called the Girls' Lounge, the place for the 17%. Because at the World Economic Forum, only 17% of white batches, which is official Congress, are women. And uh, so I didn't get the sponsorship money that I needed, which was $250,000. And so I called a girlfriend of mine that was the COO of Bloomberg, Jackie Kelly. I said, Jackie, you got to go with me. I don't want to go by myself. It's too scary. But we're going. And she said, I'll go with you. So I took my own money, paid for it, knew I had to go. And we showed up, put my little shingle up, the girls' lounge, place for the 17%. And uh, we had the best content. We, I, I did not do hair and makeup in the lounge. Best content meaning you brought people together and you would just I, bring I, speakers. We had and... a little tiny shack with big windows so everyone could see in. I hung chandelier, which I always hang to bring the feminine. I, it looked beautiful. Great food. Great content. People poked their head in. But women with the badge that knew of us from can or from, you know, cause we already had a reputation. Yeah. Came. And then Jamie diamond came and Jamie's like, Oh my God, this is the best thing I've seen at the world economic forum. I'd like to be a speaker here. And he shows up and became a speaker. And he said, I want to sponsor this. This is the best thing I've ever seen. And then Anne for Jamie diamond, the CEO of JP Morgan chase. Just saying. Yeah. That's the one. Yep. Yep. And next thing you knew, and Finucane from Bank of America, America yeah. she's retired since then, says, why am I not speaking here? And then everyone's like, well, why am I not speaking here? Why? And then the original person, company I went to was like, oh, their CEO came and said, this is the hottest spot here. And this is 10 years ago, nine years ago, little shack. And they want to be a sponsor now with the girl's lounge name. I said, you can't. And they said, why? I said, because someone has exclusivity in that category now. J.P. Morgan. Right. Jamie is the first one every year now. His team calls and says he wants to write into the schedule to make sure he can be there. He is our greatest champion. That's awesome. Every year. Heart. Real, true champion. Can you get in the room for change. president? <laughs> God bless. And <laughs> I have to tell you, today we are the destination for closing the, for changing the equation and closing the gap at the World Economic Forum, standing room only with the most incredible champions for change across Fortune 500 companies. We trend top five there. We have a two-story glass house right in the middle of the street, diagonal from Congress, and we have moved and shifted the power source. And we've changed the gender at Davos, where it's not, it is not, it's, I think the place for 17% are men now. I mean, it really is remarkable. And wow. our big sign when you walk in now says equality is possible if 
you want it. And we attract conscious leaders that all show up and they bring their A game. And it is, it is, it is just quite incredible. And so today, you know, the female quotient is all around changing the equation, closing the gap. We have the largest global community of women across every industry supporting one another. And we also have the most incredible partners, which is Fortune 500 companies with CEOs that are intentionally, purposely, consciously all in on closing the gender gap in the workplace. And that is their legacy. And it's going to be your legacy. It's ours collectively. Yeah. And, you know, the World Economic Forum says it'll take 131 years to close the gender gap. And we say not on our watch. It is a mindset gap. And if we want it, we can do it. And that's and that's your mission. And besides World Economic Forum, you're, you're here at CES and you're in, I've seen you in Cannes before. You yeah. go to no, we're all, over. all we're... the big places where influential industry people come. You set up these forums where you bring speakers sponsored by, you know, your corporate partners. And it gives women a voice and it gives awareness to the things that women are doing in business to bridge that gender gap. But we also, because we have the largest global community of women in the workplace across every category, we also are a media brand now. Yeah. So, you know, we're in experiences, media, and advisory on how to close the gender gap in the workplace. So as a CEO of a company, what advice could you give me to make sure I'm proactively trying to push gender equality in the workplace? Like, what are some things that you've seen well-intentioned lead male leaders miss on? Well, first of all, I don't think it's about whether you're male or you're female. It's just about intentional action, right. priority, choice, and realizing that of all the sustainable, the SDGs, Sustainable Development Goals, it is the only one of the 17 that you can actually control and do because it's a mindset gap in your workplace. Or in, in the world. Yeah. The other ones, hunger, poverty, sustainability, climate, you have to rely on the rest of the world. Yeah, externalities, right. To do. This is the only one you can control. The pay gap, you have the data, you can fix that one. The care gap, you can actually fix that one as well, not rely on government, but rely on yourself to put the policies in place. Yeah. Leadership gap, you can control that one as well. They're all fixable and they're actually not hard. Procurement, which is supply chain, less than 5% of supply chain goes to women. And it's not because it's a lack of women. It's not because the women aren't as talented. It's legacy issues. If you actually look at the Legacy the hood, relationship, the old boys network. It's just in place. But boom, but boom, but boom, but boom, yeah. bam. Right. Boom. Not complicated. Workforce, women in underserved parts of the world, they it, the solutions are not complicated. Also investment too. You look at the VC investments. I read very small percentage goes to one run companies. And actually, if you actually look at why, if you actually understand why most check writers are men. So the data that we're seeing is very misleading. If you look at when there's diverse check writers, the percentage is much higher. Right. We're just looking at the wrong numbers. So it sends you down the wrong path. AI, look at the bias in AI. So we're working on a whole new solution called the algorithm for equality. And we have women in 100 countries helping rewrite the rules. You're, all, you're already saying bias in AI. Of course. Junk in, junk out. If you have... It's certain, regurgitating what's on the internet. And since that exists, it's going to... I mean, and we're not facilitate. even profiling. I mean, look at the latest New York Times only profiled the men in AI. You don't think there's women in AI? Of course there are. I mean, facial recognition. We didn't even have black people encoding. So we've missed so many crucial variables. I, I mean, I can go on and on and on yeah. about the bias, the biases. So I wrote Algorithm for Equality, just even that tagline 10 years ago. Who knew AI was going to be hot? So you... You're, a lot of what you're talking about is sort of like the leadership's driving the change. and that, But when I hear about your story and what you did at OTX, a lot of it was basically you, you became the change you wanted to see. So I think to me, there's two pieces of it. It's making sure the leaders facilitate this, but it's also make sure that the woman, the young woman who entered the workforce 
have the wherewithal and the confidence that don't feel they need to ask for permission to go at, to go for it. What, how, how did you have that confidence? You talk about your, you, you know, your, your, your parents, your father supporting you. Like, what are some things that we can do to make sure the young woman can also drive it themselves? Yeah, listen, sorry, not sorry. Permission granted. When I started my company, I didn't have a choice because I am a, a mom, a grandmother. I wasn't a grandmother at the time, but primary caregiver. Yeah. And I just created the uncorporate rules because if I didn't, I wouldn't be in the workplace. Right. And so I decided that um, it's the only way I will thrive in the workplace is being my own boss, writing my own rules, which is how I became chief troublemaker. I broke every rule that made no sense and created the new ones. And so either you follow status quo, which is the rules that were written by men over 100 years ago for men. And I'm not saying that was wrong. It just was what worked then. Right. But nothing has been redesigned. So I just designed a workplace for me that would work for everyone. Because if you design it based on what a caregiver needs, it's going to work for everyone. I designed it for the lowest common denominator, which is going to work for the majority. Yeah. And so that's just what I did. So sorry, not sorry. Right. And I just, you know, yesterday in the lounge, we stamped out the imposter syndrome concept and we we wrote in the new alternative that we're kind of coming up with a new name because that's just so dumb. We just think that you have to follow status quo because that's what it's been. But what about the possibilities of what can be? Let's stop holding on to the past and let's open up the new door of opportunity and write it forward. It's not very complicated. Just because it hasn't been done doesn't mean it can't be done. And sometimes we well, think you it's... did it. That's what I'm saying. It, it, you did it yourself. But I didn't know. I didn't you know. You didn't know, but you did it. So the fact that I, the empowering part for me of what you're saying is you're somebody who actually went through the battle and won, and now you want other people to win their own battles. But you've done it yourself. And I think that's why you're successful. And that's why people believe in you, because you did it yourself. But I got to tell you, they didn't believe in me At from the, the beginning. Yeah. And even today, and this is... You know, Laura, you talked about her. Laura Desmond, Even yeah. When I did Girls' Lounge, a lot of people didn't like the name Girls' Lounge. Even women, they're like, we're not girls. And I'm like, have you ever heard of men object to being a boy in the boys' club? Like, they didn't like the name. Which I, you know, because women were, we dressed like men, and we didn't wear makeup, and we didn't do hair publicly. And, and I very consciously did it publicly. It was scary, trust me. And, and I don't blame senior level women that didn't want to come because it wasn't where the power was. Right. We weren't powerful. It was counterculture in some ways. It in was business. so counterculture. And I stuck with it, but I had to pay for it myself because getting women that were the only one, men weren't going to pay for it. Right. Brands weren't into the, and I very consciously wasn't a women's space, even though I was called a women's space. But I wasn't a feminist organization. I called it business of equality intentionally. But I didn't have CEO support. I didn't have CMO support. I didn't have women's support. I had no one's support. Right. But I've always been alone. Remember that. And so it took me a really long time to break in. You have to hold ground. Yeah. And I didn't have the money until I had the money to support myself to do it. So it's complicated. So it's not like I can just say to everyone, go spend your own money to believe in yourself. But you know what I can say is it doesn't cost money to believe in yourself. It does cost money to start your own business, but it doesn't cost money to believe in yourself. Because if you don't believe in yourself, no one else will. It costs zero dollars to shut that bitch up in your head, which is imposter syndrome. Zero dollars. For men and for women. Yeah. Men ex tend to ignore the voice. Women let that voice get louder. But the loud voice needs to be the confidence voice of, you got this. You are awesome. You have amazing ideas and you don't need to have them all. But the idea you do have to have is follow your heart, not your head. Your heart doesn't have imposter syndrome. Right. 
That's amazing. Well, it looks like we're running up on time. I mean, I feel like we could do this podcast for another hour and I want to, because I want to, I want to dig deeper into things that are more tactical that can actually push this forward. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm sure you get this a lot as people hear you and they want to take action. That's how I feel. So all about action. And you know, the one thing I also say is stop putting pledges on the table because pledges, no one follows up on a pledge. But what you do follow up on is intentional action. So, you know, if you want to move forward, commit to transformative, intentional action, action for change. That pushes you forward. We're going to leave it with that. This has been amazing. Thank you so much for sharing your story. I cannot wait for our audience to hear it. And I'm incredibly inspired. And I want to figure out ways we can collaborate more in the future. Amazing, because Thank we're you. going to talk about why you also called it Susie. Yeah, we'll do as that a guy, too. Because I can't wait to hear that too. Absolutely. On behalf of Susie and the Adweek team, thanks again to the great original Shelly Zalas, founder and CEO of the Female Quotient, for joining us today. Be sure to subscribe, rate, and review to Speed of Culture podcast on your favorite podcast platform. We're here live in Vegas at CES, and we'll see you real soon. Take care. Speed of Culture is brought to you by Suzy as part of the Adweek Podcast Network and AGAS Creator Network. You can listen and subscribe to all Adweek's podcasts by visiting adweek.com slash podcast. To find out more about Suzy, head to suzy.com. And make sure to search for the Speed of Culture in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and Google Podcasts, or anywhere else podcasts are found. Click follow so you don't miss out on any future episodes. On behalf of the team here at Suzy, thanks for listening.